For over 30 years, the University of South Carolina and the South Carolina Governor School for Science and Math have enjoyed a close and productive partnership. An important part of that relationship is the great number of research opportunities offered by USC's College of Engineering and Computing. Recently, we visited the college and met up with Dean Hussein Hajhariri. We toured the college's modern engineering, computing, and information technology facilities before sitting down to talk in the new and impressive Flight Simulator Lab. Well, Dean Hajhariri, thank you for hosting us today. Well, thank you, Micah. Delighted you could join us. Thank you. Well, now, I met you a couple of weeks ago at an event in downtown Columbia, and I believe I overheard you say that when you were younger, you were interested in philosophy. So how did you become a mechanical engineer and then a dean of a college of engineering and computing? That's a very interesting question. I guess I shouldn't have mentioned it. But uh, so I grew up in Iran and came to the U.S. in 1978 when there was a revolution in Iran. So I went to high school for two years and then went to um, MIT for studying engineering undergraduate. And at the time we had to take humanities, uh, which I thought was a waste of time, but fortunately we were forced to and I fell in love with philosophy. And um, I was working with a professor there who had a colleague at Princeton and was going to Princeton to pursue philosophy for my PhD, but because there was a revolution and uh, a relationship with Iran was difficult, I thought maybe I should get a, a degree that might be a little more employable for a foreign student at the time. So I stayed at MIT and finished engineering, uh, got my master's and PhD, but my love for philosophy has stayed and that's why I love being in comprehensive universities where students have opportunities to complement their engineering with a liberal arts education. Now, your college is well known for its research, like advanced manufacturing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those programs? What are you particularly proud of? So I'm very proud of the growth that we have had over the past, I've now been, this is my eighth year, over this time, we have invested a lot. We have uh, facilities like you see behind us now, and we have hired a lot of faculty, about 60, actually closer to 70 faculty. And as a result, our enrollment has gone up, our retention has gone up, but most importantly, our research. So now, to, um, last year, we actually had about $47 million of uh, awards, mainly from federal government. So they are in many areas. You mentioned manufacturing, but we have aerospace, we have uh, combustion related work and then we have batteries, electrochemistry, AI, so really we run the gamut and our students are very much involved in research starting in undergraduate, so I'm very proud of that. So you've been very successful as Dean. Uh, do you have a leadership philosophy? Yes, actually I do. So when I was becoming chair, I became chair um, in 2005 or 2004. So I've almost been doing this as chair or dean for close to 20 years now. Uh, I had a mentor, a colleague at Stanford who had been chair three different times in three different places. And I talked with him, I said, any advice? And he said, listen to everybody, don't waste anybody's time. And I've taken that to heart. I listen to everybody. So you have to have uh, ideas of your own, walk into the room with some ideas and say, hey, what does everybody think about this? But then you need to listen to everybody. As chair or dean, you, get, you don't get to choose. And once you listen to everybody, people have brilliant ideas. I mean, uh, as dean, I'm fortunate to be surrounded by everybody who is smarter than me. And they have brilliant ideas. And then uh, they become the champions. And my job is to resource them, run tackle for them, and get out of the way. And if people know that I don't waste their time, they come to the table with brilliant ideas. And that's really why we have had the success that we have had over the past few years. Now, I read that you were once the coordinator of a K-12 engineering lab. So uh, you must know a lot about pedagogy at different levels. Uh, what have you learned about teaching over your career? A lot. There are two types of teaching. Um, one is what happens in K through 12, which to me is the work of angels. Those teachers are incredible. Uh, your colleagues at GSSM, are, you're all incredible. Then there's teaching that happens in higher ed, uh, in college. Difficult, but uh, not as difficult as what the teachers do. So in our uh, side of the fence, in higher ed, I would say 
teaching philosophies evolve, but in engineering and computing, I think the focus should stay, and we will continue to keep the focus on fundamentals. Technology changes very rapidly, and in four years, it's impossible to teach the kids everything they need to learn. We are preparing them for jobs that may not even exist. When they start in freshman year, a job may not exist that they will be employed into when they graduate. So we need to stay focused on fundamentals and then teach them how to teach themselves and think critically. If we give them those and then introduce us them to some of the productivity tools that are becoming more and more phenomenal every day, I think they can do great work. We are well known, actually, we are one of top five universities according to skills survey as far as having work-ready students. So the employers love our students. Going to K through 12, my observation is students now learn differently. Teachers have a lot of challenges. They need to teach them a lot. But at the same time, the high skill test, the high stake test that uh, students have to go through because of state requirements have pushed many schools to push the students into too advanced a course at the expense of fundamentals. So when I was in calculus BC, there were four of us. Now half the uh, class graduates with calculus BC. And that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, but it comes at the expense of algebra and trig. And those are the fundamental skills that trip up the students when they get to college. It's not that they don't know the calculus, they don't know the algebra and trig, which is underpinning everything we teach them. So I wish schools would sort of downgrade and stay on the fundamentals and leave calculus and everything to higher education. Tell us about a special teacher in your life and why that teacher was special. As I may have mentioned to you in the past, I went to a school that was similar to GSSM. So as a high school student, we had some of the best teachers in Iran. But then when I went to MIT, there were three people that were really transformative for me. One was my advisor. He was a very young professor. And he became one of the youngest professors at MIT. He was brilliant. He always had one pad of paper and a phantom pen. And his scratch work was publishable. He was just a brilliant mathematician. And his advisor, who was also there, he was a mechanics professor and also an applied mathematician. And he just could teach you the most complex uh, topics using the simplest examples. But the teacher that made the biggest uh, impact on me, his name, I'm going to name his name, his name Professor Jim Briant. And he, uh, I had to, I was off cycle. I had to take this large class, about maybe three, 400 people in an auditorium. And at MIT, when you registered, they would take your picture, and then you were supposed to give your picture to professors. They were supposed to learn your name. Nobody did. So I went to his class, first day lecture, 300 plus people in the classroom. And he never used notes. And uh, he was giving a lecture, and he asked a question. And nobody knew the answer. And I sheepishly raised my hand. He looked at me in the middle of 300 people and said, Hossein, what do you think? And that just blew me away. This was a person that on day one knew everybody. He never used notes. So I've tried to emulate his uh, teaching style. I can never remember names, so I just gave up on that. But I never used notes. That meant preparing for every hour of lecture. It takes about three, four hours of prep. But that impresses kids, and they will learn. <laughs> so that's what I've done. Now, you have a son at the governor's school. Do you have any advice for parents who may have children interested in STEM education or STEM careers? My advice is don't push the kids into what you think is good for them. You are their parents. You are the best advisor. But also, these are young men and women who really can think well for themselves and try to embrace what they want to do and make them do that. I mean, my own son right now, he's interested in STEM, but he's also very interested in philosophy. And frankly, whichever way he goes, dad would be happy. So as far as STEM, uh, don't push kids just because the pay may be better. The starting pay, of course, is far superior. But uh, 10 years down the road, people earn what they earn based on what they can do, STEM or not. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. But thank you.
After that interview, I had a chance to walk around and talk with Dean Hodge Hariri. One of the things that I really noticed about him is how much he thinks about and cares about student preparation for college. I think one thing that struck me is he said that students need to worry about the basics. Don't think too much about trying to do advanced courses in high school, but go ahead and make sure that you have those basic courses, particularly math, so that you're ready for college. The dean also has quite a sense of humor. When we were in the flight simulator lab, he asked me to sit in the movable flight simulator. So when I got in there, he said, okay, you're right above the runway, why don't you land this plane? He then gave me crosswinds. Well, I did land the plane, not on the runway, on the grass, but I think everybody survived. Well, remember, until next time, keep learning and growing. Bye-bye.